in medicine is so much we're driven by the pharmaceutical companies, so we're looking for diseases and then we're looking for a therapy. Maybe we're not necessarily looking for the root causes, and I think that you're more interested in knowing how it evolved and what you can do to get to the problem and not necessarily given a prescription medicine. And that's how medicine is today, it really is. So many of you are way before I thought about it, were recommending probiotics. And, but there is somebody that even before you were thinking about the health of GI tract, that was Hippocrates. And he said in 418 BC that all diseases begin in the gut. So there you are. Research is proving him right. So first, there's over 100 trillion bacteria in our GI tract. Most of them reside in the colon. Most are beneficial, but some are pathogens or harmful. But maintaining the balance is a critical part. So if 85% of the guys are good guys, they keep control over the bad guys and we do okay. So here's where they are. There aren't very many in the esophagus or the small intestines. This is an aerobic environment. There's a lot of acid. It's rather fast moving, so the bugs can't stay around there very long. Lactobacillus can survive in a pH of 5.5, so there's a few of them. But they really don't start to populate the GI tract until you get towards the end. This is an anaerobic environment, the motility is slower, and that's where they start to adhere to the intestinal tract. And in the colon, that's where the more majority of the bacteria reside. So for years, we thought maybe there were 500 or 1,000 different species, and we could do that by culture techniques. But now with the uh, ribosomal RNA, these probes, they now know that if you were to sample stools of humans all over the world, there's probably more than 15,000 different bacterial species that potentially can inhabit the GI tract. And that's not what you have. Uh, each of us probably can have 500 to 1,500 species, but the majority of the bacteria that we have is only 40 or 50 different species, and that makes up 80 or 90% of our bacteria. Uh, it, when we're swimming around the amniotic fluid, we're in a sterile environment. And the first introduction to the environment is through the vaginal canal. And the, the intestinal bacteria of the mother are really important for our health. That's our introduction. And it's a different situation through uh, C-section because then it's the, uh, the bacteria that are in the environment, strep, staph, and some of the other bugs. And it really makes a difference on the development of the GI tract. If mice are kept in a germ-free state, the intestinal tract never matures. The colon and the intestinal the small intestines does not mature, mature and the lymphocy, lymphatics of the small intestines never develops. So when, once you introduce the bacteria, then the, there's maturation. And in the humans, there is this tremendous uh, crosstalk between the bacteria molecularly with singling in the development of the lining of the intestinal tract. So it's important what kind of bacteria are introduced into the GI tract. So Kay can tell better than I, but you know, the pediatric says for the first six months, all children should be breastfed. In part, it's supporting bifidobacteria. That's a critical bacteria in our health. Bifidobacteria produces uh, signaling, it produces a short chain fatty acid called butyrate, which is really important for our health. Uh, and there's a bifido factor in breast milk, which stimulates the colonization and growth of bifidobacteria. So there's a symbiotic relationship, and I'm going to use that term a lot, that we have with our intestinal bacteria. And then we do things to mess it up. Uh, dysbiosis, uh, when we have the imbalance of the microflora, there's an overgrowth of harmful organisms. And this is the whole thing we're going to talk about. It leads to chronic intestinal inflammation, increased intestinal permeability, disruption of the normal di digestion. So what I just said is in this slide. There's a dynamic community that strong, possesses a strong impact on human physiology, involved in the maturation and proliferation of the human intestinal cells, help, tains, help to maintain the homeostasis, and can be causative of various diseases. And the animal model is critical for us to have an understanding about how these bacteria function in the gut. And so there are so many systems about how mice and rats, which have very similar uh, uh, aspects physiologically with humans, that it can be used to look at the molecular interactions in between the microbes in our gut. So that's sort of some facts about the bugs. What, what are probiotics? It, the term was coined, uh, it's a Greek term, and it was coined in 1965 by 
two microbiologists, they were looking through a double head microscope and they were looking at a culture and there were some colonies of bacteria there and one was secreting a substance that stimulated the growth of the other colony so they used to call that material a probiotic. Well the term evolved over the years and probiotics were used in agriculture, it's been used in the food industry and then it was being used in medicine and in 2001 there really wasn't a lot of structure about probiotics and so there was this international meeting uh, by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the World or Health Organization that, and they were bringing some organization to what probiotics are and one thing is that they came up with the terminology of what a probiotic is and anytime you read an article about probiotic this statement appears so they're live microorganisms when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host so a probiotic is a live microorganism it can be bacteria or yeast able to and to be a candidate the, the bacteria are usually taken from healthy humans and they're now looked at to see whether they could potentially be a probiotic but to be a candidate they have to survive the gastric acid, not destroyed by pancreatic digestive enzymes and bile acids. They have to be shown to reach the colon and to adhere to the intestinal linings, and then they colonize. And obviously, they have to be non pathogenic, non toxic, and free of significant side effects. And once they reach that point, then they have to do animal studies to see what the benefit is of these particular bacteria. And each bacteria has a different function. So these are common ones that we're all aware of. So there's lactobacillus, they're very common, bifidobacteria, streptococcus, saccharomyces. So not only do you have the genus and the, and the species, but then you have strains. So if you happen to use a particular probiotic that you said, well, it's got lactobacillus acidophilus, and you go out to buy another lactobacillus acidophilus, it may be a different strain, and it may have a different impact on the intestinal tract.